A very good evening and thank you for joining us. Today we are going to look at what the Bible says about the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. And in the previous two Bible studies connected to the subject, we have seen what the Roman Catholic Church teaches uh, on the subject. They call it the Mass. We have seen that the Mass is a sacrifice and this must be kept in mind as we study the subject and uh, see what the Bible says about it. This is very important to keep in mind because Christians today get confused about what the Lord's Supper is all about. They tend towards, uh, lean towards uh, something very similar to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches on the subject. Well, let's begin in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And let's read <clears throat> verses 26 through 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verses 26 through 30. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the wine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> so you'd read about this in uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 14 and in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Now you see, when Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's table, he had not yet died upon the cross, right? But he took the, the, the cup and the bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body. The cup, he said, this is the blood of, my new, uh, of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. How could Jesus say, this is my body and this is my blood, when he had not yet given himself as a sacrifice? What does that tell you? That tells you that the elements of the Lord's Supper, that is the bread and the wine, are symbolic. They are symbolic or figurative <clears throat> because Jesus had not yet died upon the cross. Now this is common sense. This is common sense and sadly this is what many Christians lack. It's very unfortunate and I'm sorry to say so but this is the truth. Jesus had not yet died when he had instituted the Lord's Supper. So what is he saying? He's saying that you know this represents my body, which I'm going to give as a sacrifice, this cup represents, represents the blood of the New Testament, which has not yet been shed, which will be shed tomorrow upon the cross. So these elements are symbolic. This, should, this argument should be enough to lay this case to rest. But no, Christians do not have faith in what the Bible says. <clears throat> now, what greatly surprises me is this, that even after knowing what the Catholic Church teaches about the Lord's table, and even after knowing the roots or the origins of this doctrine taught by the Catholic Church, that it's purely pagan, comes from mystery Babylon, right, from the mystery religions of Babylon, from Egypt, from Greece, Knowing this full well, Christians still think that the Bible would teach something similar to that or exactly what the Catholic Church teaches. How is this possible? I do not know. Another thing that really shocks me is how Christians would begin their study of the Bible with doubt. I cannot understand that. Really, if I feel so bad about it when I think about this, I cannot imagine how God would feel when he looks at Christians when they approach the Bible. They approach it with doubt. The first thing they say is, how can this be? You see, that's the kind of attitude many Christians have. 
If you are a Bible believer, if you claim to be a Bible believer, you must begin with faith, not doubt. You must say, I believe what the Bible says. And if you are a serious student of God's word, you must keep this in mind. If you want to learn the Bible, no commentary can help you unless firstly you have faith in God's words, plural. And then secondly, what you need to do is, if you want to study the scriptures, you have to compare scripture with scripture, not with, uh, you know, some commentary that you read or the opinions of other people. Scripture with scripture, that's the key to understanding the Bible. So, those Christians who think that partaking in the Lord's table would give them some, let's say, salvation, for example, or some spiritual benefit in the sense that there is something spiritual in this bread and wine when they take it, how can you make that agree with other parts of Scripture? Why is it that you tend towards believing that these physical elements, the bread and the wine, can give you spiritual life uh, than believing other scriptures which tell you that that is not possible? The only way you can grow as a Christian is by reading and studying and memorizing and obeying the Bible. That's the only way. There are no shortcuts to growing uh, in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. There is a false piety attached to this whole doctrine of the Lord's table being something that imparts grace to the Christian. It's a false piety. It's come, uh, you know, it comes from the Calvinistic brethren kind of churches. I'm not saying that they are cults or anything. Well, especially the brethren, they have done, they have been some really great uh, work done by them. Well, the Calvinists, it's a different story, but the brethren, uh, some of them have been really good. Some of uh, the Bible teachers, right, have been really great uh, Bible teachers. I'm not saying that, but this false piety comes from these kind of churches. Oh, the Lord's table is something so holy. When you take that bread and eat it, when you drink that wine, oh, you're going into a spiritual union with Christ, a mystical union with Christ and all that kind of stuff. No, absolutely not. You know, I remember in one of the Bible colleges where I had studied, um, once a year, just before the graduation, uh, we would have the Lord's table for the whole student body. And I remember when we had that, some of the professors there <clears throat> uh, would behave like, you know, they are literally handling the body and the blood of Christ. I remember the, you know, the professor who came to give me the bread and wine, oh, he was going on, it was like a chant. You know, he was going on saying, whether anybody was listening or not, this is the bread, uh, this is the body and the blood of Christ, this is the body and the blood of Christ. Oh, he was almost shivering. I thought, what is this? What nonsense? You see, that's false piety. False piety, which is, uh, you know, which comes from believing that there could be some spiritual gain from physical elements. When will you understand, if you believe this, that from such kind of things, you can never grow spiritually? The only thing, if you would like to call this physical, I don't know if you should call this physical, but if there is something physical from which you can grow spiritually, it's this book. There's nothing else. The Holy Scriptures. And in the English language, it's the King James Bible. That's the only way to grow. These are the words of God, and God's breath is upon these words, not on the bread and wine. Anyway, let us look at what the Bible says about this. A lot of Christians have doubts from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
and from the Gospel of John chapter 6. So we are going to look at all three of these chapters if we have the time today or else in another Bible study. But we look at all three chapters and try to understand what the Bible is saying on this subject. All right, let's begin with the Gospel of John chapter 6 because that's where they all get stuck. <clears throat> the Gospel of John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And let's begin in verse uh, 51. Verse 51. Let's begin at verse 50. Or better still, let's begin at verse 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So they would look at this and say, well, Jesus said, I am the living bread. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. Right? What does this mean? You must keep this in mind, please. John chapter 6 is not talking about the Lord's Supper. I'm writing this down so that, you know, you would look at it again and again and drill it into your minds. John chapter 6 has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the Lord's table. What makes you think that John 6 is talking about the Lord's table? Just because Jesus said, right, his body uh, must be eaten, his blood must be drunk in order to be saved. So they think immediately this is a reference to the Lord's table. At least in Matthew 26, where we have just read, he had instituted the Lord's Supper. But in John 6, he had not yet even instituted the Lord's Supper. This is not talking about the Lord's table at all. What is the Lord talking about? Let's continue reading. Verse 53. Uh, well, verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now this question is very important. Verse 52. They thought he's talking about literal flesh. Right? They thought he's talking about literal flesh. Look at verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, ye have no life in you. He's talking about salvation. Right? He's talking about salvation. You have no life unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood. He's not talking about, you know, growing spiritually. He's talking about salvation. That's very clear. So the, their question is, how can he give us his flesh to eat? The answer is, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. There you see it, salvation. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about eternal life. Uh, look at uh, verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, firstly, you born again Christians will not be raised up at the last day. This is to do with the Jews, nothing to do with you born again Christians. You and I will be raised up at the rapture, not at uh, the last day. So you must keep that in mind as well because this is important. Uh, we are not going to talk about the rapture or the last day. I'm not going to get into the details, but we are still going to continue talking about the Lord's table, but uh, we need to put it in context. So that's why I'm drawing this timeline here. So Jesus Christ 
died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose up again on the third day. So this is after his ascension to heaven. The Holy Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And this is the church age that we are living in. This is the church age. The body of Christ was formed on the day of Pentecost and everyone who believes in Jesus after that is part of the spiritual body, the body of Christ. All right, let's continue reading. Uh, and by the way, you're going to be raptured here. And the last day that the Lord is talking about is a reference either to the second advent or at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. So this has nothing to do with the church. You see, everything is against their arguments that the Lord's table, the elements, the bread and wine has something to do with our salvation and our spiritual growth. It's not even talking to Christians here. All right, verse 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Again, not only is he talking about eternal life, but he's talking about his body. He's talking about his body dwelling in him. When you are baptized by the Holy Spirit at the moment of your salvation, you are baptized into the body of Christ. You become a part of the body of Christ. You dwell in Christ and Christ dwells in you through the Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is something that takes place and that's what the Lord is referring to here. You will uh, dwell in me and I will dwell in you. So... If you compare this with John chapter 4, let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 4 and let's read a long passage there, verses 10 through 15. The Gospel of John chapter 4, verses 10 through 15. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou, would have, uh, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? You see that? She has this very legitimate question. Verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into it, uh, everlasting life. You see how the Lord uses symbolic language. He says, I will give you water. Does it mean that, you know, in order to be saved, you need to drink some spiritual water? What is this water that the Lord is talking about? Of course, some of our friends would jump and say, well, that's talking about baptism. No, it's not talking about baptism. Jesus is saying that if you have asked, I would have given you water to drink. And if you drink that water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. He's talking about drinking some water. And he's saying that if you drink this water, you will have eternal life or everlasting life. What does that mean? It's symbolic, you see. The water that he's talking about is symbolic. It's got nothing to do with uh, uh, drinking literal water. This is not even wine, right? At least the wine represents his body. What does the water represent? Well, you could come up with the Holy Spirit, you could come up with the Word of God, but you see, it's all symbolic. The words that the Lord is using are symbolic words. Again, let me remind you that 
both in the Old Testament, in fact in the Old Testament, before the law, let's say the law came here, before the law and after the law, blood is prohibited. You cannot drink blood. We have seen in the previous Bible study, even in the church age, blood is prohibited. No blood. You cannot drink blood. Blood, uh, blood is prohibited in both the Testaments, before the law, after the law, and after the cross. Nobody is supposed to drink blood or eat blood. What exactly is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about in the Gospel of John chapter 6? We have seen in chapter 4, he said, you must drink this water that I'll give you and you'll have everlasting life. It's symbolic. It is symbolic, not of water baptism, not of the Lord's table. It's just everlasting life or the Holy Spirit being compared to water. All right. And he says, you drink this water, you'll live eternally. You'll have everlasting life. It's symbolic. So in John chapter 6, when he says, you must eat my body and drink my blood, again, he is using symbolic or figurative language. And we're going to look at that because you see, remember what I said, you must compare scripture with scripture when you study the Bible. And when you compare what Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman, he said, the water that I give you, if you drink it, you'll have everlasting life. You compare that with John chapter 6 where he said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to get eternal life, right? He's talking about salvation. Now compare this with all the other verses you know about salvation. What will you understand? Think about it. You pray about it. And let the Lord show you that the Bible gives you very clear uh, understanding as to how a man can be saved, as to how a sinner can be saved. It's not through water baptism, it's not by taking the Lord's uh, table, it is by faith and faith alone in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing else, absolutely. So how will you make a, a mixture of all these things. John chapter 4, John chapter 6, and let's say Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, right? Or John, for that matter, even John 1, 12. How will you, uh, you know, understand all these things and say, all these things will save? It cannot be, right? There's only one way a sinner can get saved in the New Testament and that is by faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Compare scripture with scripture. Now look at these verses in the Gospel of John chapter 6. Let's read uh, verse 35, verses 35 and 36. Gospel of John chapter 6 verses 35 and 36. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Why is it? Because he's going to, you know, pounce on Jesus Christ and tear his flesh apart and eat it and drink his blood? No, look at that. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Remember the same thing he said to the Samaritan woman. If you drink the water I give you, you'll never thirst. So Jesus is progressing in this crazy doctrine. First he said, drink water, then you'll have eternal life. Now he's saying, drink blood. At least according to some of these Christians who believe that there is something, uh, you know, salvific in the elements of the Lord's table. Look at what he says. Verse 35 of Gospel of John chapter 6, the last part. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see that believeth. How do you quench your thirst? According to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. Not go and uh, eat the bread and drink the wine. Believe. Nothing else. Absolutely nothing. Verse 36, 
But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And believe not. It's all about faith that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. Faith in his death and resurrection. That's what he's talking about, about the body that he will give as a sacrifice, the blood that he's going to shed for the remission of sins. That's what he's pointing to, you see. He's not pointing to the Lord's table. He's pointing to his own sacrifice, which he gave once upon the cross when he died for our sins. So you see that in verses 35 and 36. It's very clear that everything he's talking about is to do with believing. Believing. Um, here he said to her, if you drink the water that I give you, you will have everlasting life. So again, it's to do with believing. Nothing to do with drinking any literal water. It's figurative. Now look at uh, verse 40. Verse 40. John chapter 6 verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, you see that? It is about believing. It's got nothing to do with eating anything or drinking anything. Uh, look at verse 47. Verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life, he says in verse 48. And he goes on to talk about how they need to eat his body and drink his blood. What do they mean? What does he mean? He means when you believe, what's going to happen? You're going to get eternal life. You're going to be baptized into his body. You're going to dwell in him and he is going to dwell in you. That happens by faith, not by eating bread and drinking wine. Why is this so difficult for Christians to understand? It's because of the spiritual blindness, you see, which is a result of not believing what God has said, as he said it and where he says it. That's also important because, you see, we study the Bible according to dispensations. Look at... Uh, um, let's continue to look at a few more verses here. Well, then these disciples started murmuring at what Jesus said. And now he says in verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see that again? Believe what? The words that I speak to you. So in this church age, you are born again by faith. Faith in what? In the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you get that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? By hearing the word of the gospel, the words of the Bible. You see, that's how you're saved. It's to do with believing. Right, let's read that verse again. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Memorize this verse and meditate upon it. Pray over it till the Lord opens your eyes and the light of a million mornings comes shining through into that dark mind filled with unbelief. And I'm talking to those who believe that, you know, there is something special about the bread and wine. Verse 63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see that? We are born again by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit according to the Bible. I will show you those verses. But, the flesh profiteth nothing. You see that? He's talking about his own flesh. The flesh of Christ, if you eat it, it profits nothing. 
You must keep this in mind, please. The flesh profits absolutely nothing. That means even if the body of Christ were available to us today, and we put it on this table here and start eating it, it's not going to profit us anything. We'll be like the cannibals that we studied about in the previous two Bible studies, right? These are cannibals who eat the literal flesh of Christ and drink the literal blood of Christ. They are cannibals. And Jesus is saying that cannibalism is not going to give you eternal life. The flesh, my flesh, if you eat it, it will profit you nothing. You see, why did Jesus ask, uh, you know, say this? Verse 63, he said this because of verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's why he's saying this. And again, uh, verse 60, many therefore of his disciples when they had heard this said, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? And what if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He is saying the words of verse 63 to clarify to these people that he is not talking about his literal flesh and his literal blood. In John chapter 3 we know that you are born again by the Holy Spirit. Again there Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. You are born again by the spirit, by the Holy Spirit, nothing else. Um, and then in verse 63, he says in John chapter 6, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How do you get saved? By believing the words of the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose up again on the third day according to the scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear that and you get saved. The Holy Spirit performs that transaction. What he does is he takes the believer. Of course, a lot of things happen at that moment of salvation. We have done many Bible studies on that subject. He takes him and he baptizes him into the body of Christ. So now, think about it. Salvation has nothing to do with the Lord's table. In fact, John chapter 6 has nothing to do with the Lord's table. John chapter 6, Jesus is saying this in summary. He's saying that you don't get saved by any physical stuff. You get saved by faith, by believing. This is the work that you must do. Believe on him that the Father sent, he says in that same chapter. What work should we do, they say. This is the work that you should do. Believe, he says, in me. So John chapter 6, Jesus is trying to teach them by using symbolic language that they must believe in him in order to come dwell in him and for him to dwell in them. That's the summary of John chapter 6. It's got nothing to do with the Lord's table. It's got nothing to do with being saved by eating that bread or drinking that wine. But you see, this to many Christians, uh, you know, may not be a problem. Because they, for them, the stumbling block is not John 6. The stumbling block is in John, uh, 1 Corinthians 10. The stumbling block is in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to get there as well. But you see this, you must first understand that John chapter 6 is not talking about the Lord's Supper at all. Not one word. He, the Lord had not even instituted the Lord's Supper by then. And in Matthew chapter 26, where he did, uh, you know, institute the Lord's Supper, even there, the Lord had not yet died. You see, we had already read in Matthew 26. You can also look up Mark 14 and Luke chapter 22. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he had not yet died. So what does that mean? He's speaking in symbolic language. He is speaking in symbolic language. 
So now, once you understand this, and this is clear in your mind, next we can move to the gospel, uh, to sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll look at a few verses there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's begin in verse 16. Okay, before we go to verse 16, let's look at the first four verses uh, of John chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Let's stop there. So he's saying that at the time of Moses and the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt, they were all baptized unto Moses, right? And it looks like they ate spiritual bread, which is manna, he calls it the spiritual bread, and drank spiritual water. All right, so this, is, you know, it doesn't mean that they were looking forward to the cross and all that nonsense. Okay, don't get these ideas in your mind. Paul, again, is using figurative language here. He says uh, that they were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea, right, through the Red Sea. And he says that is symbolic of being baptized. They were baptized not unto the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized unto Moses. Now look at that. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? What was the spiritual meat they ate? They ate manna. Was it spiritual? What was spiritual about manna? You remember when they kept it or, or, or when they gathered more than what was necessary, it started to rot and stink. Is that the spiritual manna uh, or, or spiritual food that he's talking about? How is it that that spiritual food started to rot and started to stink? Think about it. Verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now tell me, we know that Jesus referred to himself as the rock. In Matthew 16, 18, right? Jesus is the rock. Not Peter, by the way. That's what the Catholic Church teaches, that Peter is the rock. Jesus said, Thou art Peter, on this rock I will build my church. He's referring to himself. Peter is a stone, it's a small stone, but he's the rock, he's a big rock. There's a great difference there. He's not saying, Thou art Peter, upon you I will build my church. Nor is he saying, Thou art Peter, upon your confession I'm going to build the church. No. He's absolutely not talking about building the church on Peter or on Peter's confession. He's saying, I'm going to build my church on myself. And Paul says that in the book of Ephesians. He says, Jesus Christ is the foundation, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, no other foundation can be laid than that, than that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the rock. He's the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. If anybody is a part of that foundation it's all the apostles because you see it's through the apostles that God gave the scriptures so the rock is Christ there's no doubt about that that rock was Christ does that mean Jesus Christ went and started you know uh, dwelling inside that rock was Jesus really inside that rock which gave water what is it it's all symbolic you see it's all symbolic it's Peter saying that rock from which they drank is a type of Christ. Now think about this. Why did Moses, uh, why was Moses denied entrance into the promised land? It's because the second time 
instead of speaking to the rock, he smote it twice, right? He was angry and he spake unadvisedly, the Bible says. What did he say? Should I get water out of this rock for you? As if it was him who, was, who had given them water.